Everyone has a story to tell. Welcome to Dingo Talk, where we explore the experiences that make us who we are. Here's your host, Carlo Guadagnino. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest this week is the head football coach of St. John's U of the Minnesota Interscholastic Athletic Conference, uh, Coach Gary Fasci. Uh, coach Fasci is a St. John grad from 1981. He then returned to St. John's in 1996 before becoming the head coach in 2012, replacing legend John Gaglardi, uh, who had retired after 60 years. So we're going to talk to him about, uh, one, going back and coaching at his alma mater. Two, talk a little bit about Midwest football, um, as this is going to kind of become a trend here in the next couple weeks. Um, but we also just kind of want to want to talk about uh, how he felt about the number seven ranking finishing the season up um, and, and where he thinks that team could have been and where he thinks this team this year in 2023 could go. Um, for those of you that are watching at home on the YouTube, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button. If you're listening to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Amazon, or wherever else you get your podcast, make sure you hit the little bell and uh, don't miss any of the episodes. And make sure you're following us on the social medias. That's TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. The only one that's different is the Instagram page. That's dingo underscore talk. But without further ado, here we are with Coach Gary Fashy. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest this week is the head coach of St. John's University football team, Coach Gary Fashing. Did I say that right, Coach? Fashing. I got I, it. I, I'm going to mess yep. it up. I, uh, so, Coach, I want to say thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, we're going to do this the way we do every week. I'm going to take you back in time to your playing days, and we're going to work our way forward to today. So, All right. Sounds great. How did you find your way to St. John's in 1977? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, coming out of high school, I, um, you know, I, I was looking at a lot of different schools. I visited a number of different schools. Um, my uh, the head basketball coach at the high school that I played at, his brother went to St. John's and was a basketball star here. Played football for one year. And he said, you should take a look at St. John's. You seem like a St. John's type of guy. So uh, amongst a lot of the other schools around in the state, uh, some other Division three, some Division twos, And I, I even messed around a little bit with going to the University of Minnesota and walking on there. Uh, and that was an offer that I had early on. Uh, it didn't seem like that was something that I really wanted to do. And St. John's was just coming off a national championship in 1976. So I knew about them and thought, okay, well, they obviously are very good. And John Gallardi, the head coach at that time, was uh, very well known. So I came up here and visited and uh, fell in love with the campus uh, and uh, decided this is the best place for me to go. Now, now what you, you said a couple of things there. What is a St. John's guy? What is that? What, what, what does that entail? It's a great question because, you know, as now as the head football coach, sometimes we get recruits in here and I'll tell our, my assistant coaches, I don't think he's a St. John's guy. And uh, so that's a good question that you asked that. I think there's a couple of things. Number one, uh, we look for guys who are self-motivated. Mm -hmm. um, somebody who's honest. You know, somebody that you can count on, it, 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 that's probably no different than any other program. But we've always talked about, you know, our guys being St. John's guys. They fit the mold of what we're looking for, not only as a football player, but certainly as a human being also. And, and uh, you know, we want our guys to be the best. And we talk about that all the time. And and uh, so I, I think I felt like I fit that bill back in 1977. I feel like the 53 freshmen we have coming in this year also fit that same bill. Now, coach, what, when, when you, as you're going through, was it in the back of your head that you wanted to stay involved in the game, be a coach or be, be involved in football at some point, or was it kind of not thinking about it until 
you know, the time comes where it's next, make that next decision. Another great question. So when I was in high school, I, I had two just tremendous high school coaches. My head football coach at uh, Winston Holy Trinity, where I went small private school um, here in Minnesota. Um, Larry Anderson was his name. Great mentor, great role model. And, uh, and then I had uh, my basketball coach, a guy by the name of Gail Moore. Um, and he was also the assistant football coach. Those two guys were just tremendous role models. Um, the kind of people that you want to emulate. And um, so, you know, I thought about, you know, maybe that's, that's uh, something that I, to think about going into teaching and coaching. I had a number of my teachers back at that time that said, you know, you should go into business. You'd be a great salesman and blah, blah. So when I came to St. John's, I took some business classes and I found out about mid semester, my first year. Uh, I don't think business and, and Gary <laughs> Fosh go together. So I went with my, what my first love and what I really wanted to do. I went into education and got my coaching degree and and um, and just went from there with it. Now, so for those of you that don't know, Coach played uh, linebacker. Start You started at a linebacker for three years. Uh, yep. How do you translate from being a college football player? And there's a little bit of a gap there. But then how do you make your way to, I want to make sure I say this right, St. Cloud Cathedral? Yep. How did you make your way there? And now we get into your coaching career. Well, when I graduated in 1981 from St. John's, um, applied for a number of different jobs and that happened to be one that was open and it's only about 15 minutes away from St. John's. Um, and I thought, you know, that would be a, 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 a good place. I, I had gone to, I had gone to uh, a private Catholic schools my whole life um, um and then so going to cathedral seemed like another good good opportunity there so uh for the first four years i was an assistant coach there and then when the head coach left um uh, i took over in 1986 as the head football coach i was also assistant basketball and head track at the time so um and i stayed there for 14 years it was a great um it was a great learning experience for me. It, it got me, um, it, I think it, it set me off on my, on my path to, to being a, a college coach because I, you know, I think at, at the very beginning, I thought, well, you know, high school's a good, good spot. And, and, um, you know, when I was there, our kids were starting to get into now getting into junior high, high school. So, mm -hmm. Uh, it seemed like a great uh, opportunity to stay there also. Fortunately, I'd won two state titles there. Uh, they'd never won a state title before, so uh, we won two of them while I was there. And um, and then I started getting other people saying, you know, you should maybe look at some other things, bigger schools. And and um, and then, you know, fortunately, uh, an opening occurred here at St. John's. And, and uh, Coach Gallardi at the time called me up and asked if I'd be interested. And, I said I'd certainly be interested, so I came here and and uh, was an assistant for 17 years uh, with him. And then when he resigned or retired, excuse me, when he retired uh, at the age of 86. By the way, I'm not going to coach that long. Um, <laughs> that was going to uh, be a so, question. Yeah, when he retired, <laughs> then uh, I was fortunate enough that I got the job. Now, so I have a couple questions. Being a Pittsburgh guy. Um, Western Pennsylvania football is, it was drilled into me that, that it's, you know, you got Florida, you got Texas, you got California and people will say Pennsylvania, but if you're from Pittsburgh, it's not that other side of the state. It's, it's the Whippeal. So yep. give us a little, give us an insight onto Minnesota high school football and Minnesota football as a whole. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think, um, first of all, the game has gotten better and better in the state of Minnesota and, um, uh, I think every year we see that, uh, you know, you look at, you know, the, the D1 school in our, in our state, uh, mm -hmm. University of Minnesota, they've had some recent success now with PJ Fleck as their coach. They get, they get a lot of Minnesota kids, North Dakota state. I think everybody's heard of North Dakota state. They get a lot of Minnesota kids. So they come into our state and recruit the, the state very heavily wow. along with South Dakota state. So some of the surrounding 
states mm-hmm. um, really come in and recruit hard. And um, and so the level of football here, I think, has gotten really, really good. You know, you look at the metro area of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and the suburbs, a lot of good football teams in that area. High school football, um, I think, is really taken off in the state. We've got great coaches. Um, uh, they're, they're experienced. They're, they're knowledgeable. And they really do a great job in their schools. So um, I find over the years that I've been – now this is going to be my 42nd year as a, as a coach. I found out over the years – that uh, I'm more and more impressed with the state of Minnesota football uh, than I've ever been. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a credit to the high school coaches and and also to the other colleges in the state here. We have some great football, even in our league, uh, Bethel University uh, in our league, they've been in the playoffs a number of times and they have a great program, very mm-hmm. solid. So uh, there's a lot of great schools in the state and, and uh, I would uh, – say very proud to be part of the football experience here in Minnesota. Coach, what's your coaching philosophy and how has it changed in those, in those 40 plus years? Well, I don't think it's changed very much. Uh, You know, I would say maybe I've changed a little bit. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm probably a little bit more mellow than I was when I started out back in 1981 or 82. Um, I hear that from some of my former high school players when they come and watch me now and they go, wow, you're, you're really mellow compared to what you were as a high school coach. And uh, I think that happens over, over years, but you know, my philosophy is this, I think number one, you got to treat people the right way. And, and that just, that goes with your players, your coaches, you know, the people in your community um, because that, I think that's kind of the, the stepping stone to, to having a great program. Mm-hmm. Um and, and we're not trying to get converts here. I'm not trying to convert people to do things the way we do here at St. John's because there's a lot of ways of coaching football. Uh, but what I found is I think if you treat people the right way, uh, they're going to respect you and play for you. Mm-hmm. The, probably the biggest thing that I learned from John Gallardi, who coached here for 60 years, by the way, that's 6-0. Uh, that's I saw that in your thing. I saw that in the bio yeah. as, a, as I was going through it. it it's, that's a number that jumps out at you very quickly. Yeah. yeah, that and the fact that he won 489 games during yeah. those 60 years. But uh, the thing that I probably learned the most from him was preparation. Mm-hmm. You know, preparing yourself and your team to play a football game. And, you know, he always used to say, you know, we never practiced long, but we practiced really smart. And he always say, you know, we're not invading Mars. We're playing a football game. So, you know, our our approach was always way different than everybody else's. And I don't know how much people know about our program, but we just wear helmets and shoulder pads. We're never in full gear. And we've been practicing that way for 50 some years. Wow. Um, and, you know, now you see everybody kind of practice that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, the NFL has to do that. Um, but Coach Gallardi, way back in the 1970s, he had already decided that, you know, to keep your guys healthy and to take care of them and and make sure they're ready to go on game day, you better protect them and practice a little bit. So Mm -hmm. we would work extensively on preparation and then uh, making sure that our guys were prepared to play a game. Oh, yeah. You know, making sure that they, you know, repetition, we always say repetition, repetition, repetition. The more you run plays, the better you're going to be at them. The more you see plays, the better you're going to be able to defend them. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's kind of my philosophy, and I really haven't changed. I use that same thing in high school, and I've used the same thing here at St. John's all my years, and and uh, and it seems to have worked. Well, and it's crazy that you say that that it's that you guys started doing that in the '70s, where. Yep. I would imagine you were a lone island of of guys not going full tilt, but there's a there's a there's that other part of the game. It's a physical game, but it's just as yep. much a mental game. And when you don't have, when you take out the physical part of it, the mental has to be perfect. So it's a no, very interesting. Awesome. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right, and we talked about that all the time. We're going to be the most prepared football team now. We always used to joke. Uh, 
when other teams would show up to play us because they're running all these, you know, orchestrated uh, pregame stuff and and we don't. Ours looks like uh, a bunch of people that uh, showed up for the first time and, you know, we got guys running into each other and, uh, you know, but it, it's not that bad. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we always say we lose every we lose every pregame. But then when the game starts, that's when we were at our very best. And um, I think that's, you know, part of what we do here. And, and our players have picked up on that. And, it, and it, it helps that from year to year, your players who've been a part of the program for the previous years, mm -hmm. they understand that whole thing. They know, hey, we're going to be mentally prepared to play a football game. Uh, the physical part of it, you know, we're, we have college football players. They're going to be ready to go, you know. Uh, but it's the mental part and the preparation, making sure that every scenario that happens in a football game we're going to make sure that we cover that. So when it does happen in a game, they're going to they're going to see it and be able to react to it. Coach, what what is the significance of the MIAC? Because as I was looking down through your your conference and the way your schedule kind of played out, you saw Bethel early, but then you saw them again at the end of the season, and it was kind of a. Uh, and I want to get into that conversation as well. But just talk about the conference a little bit and how it's developed and become, as you were saying earlier, that the, the football as a whole has gotten better. What, what's the importance of your conference? Well, I think, first of all, there's a, we're, we're, we may be the only conference where we have two divisions mm -hmm. and you don't play everybody. Um, and we did that for a number of reasons. A, a number of years ago, St. Thomas, which was a team in our league, uh, decided to go Division One. And um, we had a couple of schools that were struggling a little bit. And we, we brought in a couple of new schools and to kind of get them up to speed and maybe, you know, um, make sure that they were prepared. Our conference is good. I mean, yeah. I would say in, in Division Three football, you have the Wisconsin Conference, who's really, really tough with Whitewater and, you know, a bunch of those teams. You have the Ohio Conference with Mount Union, you know. We know we're always going to get a good team from out in your area. There's a lot of good football out that, in that area. Um, so our, our conference is a, a really good football conference. So we wanted to get those teams up to speed. So our conference decided to go two, two uh, divisions. And you only play, for example, we won the conference. Well, we've won the last four uh, conference titles. So we're only going to play the top teams in the other division. We okay. will not play. We will not play the the two bottom teams in the other division, um, and likewise, uh, the two bottom teams in our division will not play the top two teams in the other division. So it, it now it, it creates a little bit of a problem because scheduling is not easy. To try to find two non conference games is not real easy to do, and um, so you know, for example, this year, uh, our first game, Trinity of Texas, is coming up here. Trinity is ranked fifth in the country. They're a heck of a football team. We've got our hands full. Mm -hmm. um, people ask me, who scheduled them? And I go, you're looking at the guy. And they go, are you crazy? But anyway, um, <laughs> you know, and then we go week two, we have Whitewater uh, as our other non-conference game, go to Whitewater. And then we come back home and we have Bethel. So our first three games are uh, against top uh, ranked teams. Yeah. And um, but our conference, I would say this, uh, even though the divisional schedule that we've had for two more years, and we're going to have it for two more years, it's a four-year plan. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those teams that we brought in, the McAllisters, the St. Scholastics, they've gotten better in the last two years. So um, overall, like I said, I'm, I'm really impressed with our league. We've got great coaches in there. Uh, they care about kids. They do it the right way. And um it makes it fun to coach in, in this league and it makes it fun for our players because they know they're going to be facing a competitive team every week. Well, and I, I was looking at the, it's funny you bring up the rankings because I was looking, you know, you have your uh, North central, you have Mount, yep. I believe Mary Harden Baylor's in there. Yep. Bethel yep. and Trinity are in there. Yep. And then, you know, not, not to, not to discredit you guys, number seven at the end of the year, um, yep. Now, my here's my question. So, four point loss early in the season to Bethel, twenty eight twenty four. Come back at the end of the season, 
you beat Bethel. How yeah. did the rankings and how did they end up ahead of you in the rankings? And does that put a chip with you? Does that put a chip with the players? Is there any like, ah, I don't really, it's, it, it, it's a number. It's a group of guys sitting around saying, oh, this team's better than this team. How did you feel about that? Well, um, first of all, the, the first time we played them, it was a great game down at their place, packed stadium for them. And, um, you know, it was a, I would say it was a game of big plays. Mm -hmm. um, we would make a big play. They would make a big play. Um, and uh, really it came down to, you know, we had an opportunity at the end of the ball game. And, and uh, unfortunately, a uh, ball got tipped and they picked it off and, and ended our threat. Um, great ball game. But we knew this because of the two divisions, the top team in each division plays off for the championship at the very last game of the year. So we, after we lost that game, which was week three, we kind of said, well, there's a very good chance that we're going to see these guys again because mm -hmm. we knew they were very good. And, you know, we felt we were a good football team. And sure enough, we meet them again in the championship game. And our guys played really well. I mean, we uh, we prepared very well. Um, their quarterback had a little bit of an injury, and we were able to knock him out of the game. Uh, he had an injury from the week before and came back and tried to play against us. And he took a couple hits early in the game. And then um, so that hurt them because he was one of the top. He was the MVP of our league. Wow. Um, now, how did they end up ranked higher than us? Well, we both got in the playoffs. We were the we were the automatic bid. They got in as a as an at large, and they played really well in the playoffs. Their quarterback got healthy, and uh, they had Mary Harden Baylor on the ropes to wow. get into the final four, and they ended up losing in the fourth quarter. So they went a week further than we did. So you know, if you base it on that, uh, at the end of the year, you could say they were a better team than we were, and that's why they were ranked higher than us. I, I feel that that's going to be a real fun game come week three for you guys. I, I'm not I'm not in the game of predictions, but I'm just saying I think that it's going to be a very fun, interesting uh, contest back and forth. Um, Coach, one more question uh, for the uh, – actually, the only question I'm going to ask you about. 2020, how did you yep. guys work through – and I know I think everybody was off in the fall. Was yep. there a spring season for you guys in that following, or was there were you were you guys kind of part of that group that said, "Hey, let's just wait and we'll go fall of twenty one as opposed to spring of twenty one yeah, you know that was a tough decision because we knew we weren't going to play in the fall mm -hmm. and um as a coach as the coaches in our conference got together and they said, "Well, let's plan on having a spring season, and we knew it probably wasn't going to be a full spring season. So we started talking about, you know, maybe it's going to be four, five, six games in the spring. And as we got into the spring, all of a sudden, there were teams in our league that said, we're not playing in the spring. And um, then it, it came down to really only a couple teams that were. And we were one of those who said, you know, we're certainly thinking of playing in the spring. And when it came down to it, there was only one or two other teams that were going to play. And then we thought, well, and we could only have 250 fans at the game. Um, and quite frankly, we weren't going to play our best guys because we were going to get ready for the fall. I wasn't going to lose, you know, our All-American wide receiver in the spring yeah. in a meaningless game. So we decided as a staff that we weren't going to play in the spring and just get ready for the fall of 2021. And I think that was the right decision at that time because I don't know that we would have gained anything by playing two or one or two games in the spring. When I, I know that the PAC attempted there, there was a spring uh, a high, I call it the hybrid spring because it was on Monday, you were playing on Saturday, but by Wednesday, this person tested positive yeah. and this coach, and then it was, yeah. you yeah. know, you didn't know what you were doing. So right. um, exactly. As a whole, where do you feel the 2022 team was last year um, as a group, as a, as a team that one of your teams that you've coached, where would you put them in preparation, how they were prepared, the talent level, and and then what the outcome of the season was? You know, going into last year, we, we, um, we felt really good about our, our football team. Uh, we had a number of guys coming back and key guys. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
And then about two weeks before the season started, uh, one of our running backs who we were counting on, he kind of rotated in the year before. He tore his ACL in a non-contact, just seven-on-seven seven drill. And um, so he was done for the year. But we went into the game. We we started off. We had um, – you know, Whitewater right away week one, and we beat them here at home in front of, you know, 13, 14,000 fans. It was a great game, and and uh, it was just a great atmosphere. You know, then we uh, beat uh, River Falls the next week, another Wisconsin team who was very good. So we started off really well. Then we had the Buffalo loss, and then we ran the table. We played really well. Uh, unfortunately, in the championship game, we lost our other running back, our top running back, Henry Trost, who had been a three-year starter for us. And Henry was a big, physical, tough, fast runner. And um, so we didn't have him in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And uh, that hurt us. And then uh, um, in the second playoff game, we lost our leading wide receiver as far as catches. He got hurt in that game. So to answer your question, after the after the playoff loss in the second round at the press conference, one of the uh, um, newspaper guys said, um, you know, coach, what did you think about this team? Were you good enough to win it all? And I said, if we were completely healthy, we would have had a chance to be a final four team. I really believe that, but you can't take out your best running back mm -hmm. and you can't take out your, you know, best receiver as far as catches and expect that you're going to beat top teams in the country it just doesn't happen that way. You know, so in our case, we were down to our third and fourth running back now because yeah. we lost the other kids. So um, I think we were a solid football team. I don't think that we were probably good enough to win a national title based on what I saw from the other teams. North Central, fantastic football team. Mount Union, always fantastic. Um you know, Wartburg out of Iowa, the team that beat us, they were really, really solid football team. So I don't think um, we were quite there. Had we been healthy, I would say we would have been a, a Final Four team. And now leading in that question leads me into this question. We're, I'm guessing we're about a week away from, from this kickoff of camp. How do you feel? Now, obviously, we haven't seen anybody on the field yet for the season. But how do you feel after the spring, summer workouts, and now going into camp? What are what are your expectations for this season? Well, we've got um, we got a lot of guys back um, on the offensive side of the ball. We lost two starters: our left guard and our left tackle. Okay. I think we have guys who can replace them. It's going to take them a while to get into the you know um, at the level those other guys are playing. But we have our quarterback back, which I think is really important. We have all of our skill guys back, uh, including Alex Larson, who's a six-seven tight end, who's been a two-time All-American. I think he's got a great opportunity here to get drafted if he has a really good season. Um, we've got uh, we lost Trost, our running back, but we gained the other kid back who tore his ACL, Devin Volk. So we feel really confident about our offense going into this year. Defensively, we lost two incredible defensive tackles. Mm -hmm. They were both All-American, which is rare to have two defensive linemen be All-Americans. But we lost those two guys, and then we lost probably our top defensive back, our corner. So we've got a little bit of work to do there, but still we have eight of uh, 11 guys back there. We have both kickers back. So if you look at it on paper, we should be pretty good. Mm -hmm. you know. Now, um, we have a target on our back because we've won four straight conference titles. We've been in the NCAA playoffs eight years in a row. So you know everybody's gunning for you. Yeah. And so that, you know, in a sense, maybe that makes it a little bit more difficult because you know that you're going to get your best from everybody, which we, that always happens here anyway, I always mm -hmm. say. But I think, you know, I think we've got a great opportunity. Now our guys are going to have to come and they're getting, but I, I like our approach of our guys in the spring. They were very, very good. And uh, what I've seen this summer of the guys who stayed around and what I've heard from, you know, from our uh, other guys who are went back home, uh, they worked out hard and they're, they're getting excited about the season. Uh, Coach, what is your biggest, like when you're, and we already talked about it a little bit, what's a St. John's guy, 
But for you, when you're talking to a parent or or a recruit, what's that conversation like? Between like, can you can you get us behind the door for a second? Yeah. And what's that Absolutely. conversation like? Yeah. Well, you know, the number one question I always ask, the first question I ask a recruit and their parents when I'm sitting in my office with them is I say, "What are you looking for? What kind of things are you looking for?" I want to make sure that it's a fit. And, um, you know, if if the first conversation out of their mouth is not something about academics, then it's going to the conversation is probably not going to be very long um, because that's why you're going to college, especially yeah. at the Division three level. You're coming here to get a great education. Football happens to be the icing on the cake, uh, I always say. But, you know, I tell them. If, if you send your son, number one, we're going to take great care of them. We're going to treat them the right way. We're going to take care of them. My job as a football coach, I know I have to win football games here. Um, but I also know that your son has to graduate in four years. And I also know that we have to give him every kind of tool and skill he's going to need to be successful for the rest of his life. So I always say we prepare your son for the next 40, 50 years of his life. So he becomes a great community member, a great father, a great husband, you know. Um, all those things are really important. So our conversation, a lot of times we don't talk a lot of football stuff. We talk about all the other things that are that are part of what we do here. I'm really lucky because we have 12 coaches on our coaching staff. We have six full-time guys, mm -hmm. and then we bring in another six guys to help out at practice. We have 201 kids coming in on August wow. 11th. So we have a big football team. So we need, anyway, we have of those 12 coaches, 11 of them played here and went to school here at St. Chas. So we get it. We understand what it's, this is about. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about being a St. John's guy, our guy, our coaches are those guys. So um, we're able to, I always tell our recruits, you're, you're going to be really fortunate because you're coming to a school where the coaches, they've been in your shoes. We've sat in that chair. We know what it's like. Mm -hmm. We're going to be able to help you out. And then when you graduate, we're going to be there for you for the next 40, 50 years of your life. Now, I may not be there for that long, um, <laughs> but, you know, our young coaches will carry on that tradition and move it forward just like, you know, Coach Gillardi did and like I did following him. So that's that's really what the conversation entails. You know, when we when I have that discussion with guys when they come into my office. Coach, what was the biggest takeaway that you got from Coach Gillardi? Well, I would say two things. I've mentioned the one already, the preparation part of it, because no one prepared like he did. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was relentless when it came to uh, watching film and making sure that that uh, uh, your teams were well prepared. And I learned that playing for him. And then I learned that uh, when I became a high school coach, because I saw what he did and I carried that on as a high school coach. And then when I got to coach with him, I saw it even more, you know, because now you're here every day with him and mm -hmm. you see what he does in preparation. So that was the big thing. I think, um, you know, the, the preparation. And then the other thing is, I think the relationship that you have with your players, that is such an important thing. Um, you know, to treat your players with respect and 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 um, and give them some say in the program. You know, for many years when John was coaching, he let the quarterback call the plays up until wow. he would really retire back in 2013. Our quarterbacks are still calling most of the plays. Uh, I, I don't have the guts to do that right now, but uh, <laughs> um, but he 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 let the and the players always felt like they had. A, a say in, in the program and we still do that we we take their you know we 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 ask for their advice sometimes and we ask them hey how you know what do you think one of the first things i do after the first series of a game i'll go over to the offensive line and i go guys what plays do you think we should be running they're out there they know you know yeah. and um so and, and that's part of everything that we do here but i think that relationship that you have with your players I think that makes a big difference in the success mm -hmm. of your program. Coach, I got two questions about division three. One, what's the biggest difference between the divisions? Obviously we know no scholarships, 
That's the big, there's no, which is kind of, a, in my opinion, a myth because there is money out there. You just have to kind of, you have to apply for the grants and whatnot. But in your opinion, what's the biggest difference? Well, that's a great question because we get a number of transfers from Division I schools and Division II schools. And I ask them that every time. And they always say the biggest difference is the speed of the game. Okay. Because at every position at a D1 level, you have kids who are, they're the top players. I mean, they're, yeah. and, and I would say at the Division Three level, you have some of those players, but maybe you don't have all of those players on the field. So the speed of the game is always a big thing that I hear from, from guys. You know, the size of players, I mean, I look at our offensive line right now, and we're going to average 290, almost 300 pounds on the offensive line, you know, and, you know, there's division one schools that might even be smaller than that. Yeah. So I don't know that it's necessarily the size, but certainly the speed of the game makes the biggest difference. And then the follow-up to that is what is the significance or importance of the division three level? Because when we talk about division one, division two, and I, I've, even as I've been going through Twitter today, I saw a bunch of things about NAIA, and it seems that Division Three is now starting to creep into being talked about, but it still doesn't seem like it gets as much respect as it should as a former Division Three athlete myself. I just, it's a little chip I carry. But so what do you think the significance of Division Three? And I think you touched on a couple things. Well, number one, I think uh, it's the purest form, right? Because the kids that are playing in Division Three, guys like yourself, myself, the players we have here now in other Division Three schools, they're mm -hmm. playing for the love of the game. They're not getting scholarship money to play football. They're they're probably really good students like most of ours are, and they're getting really good financial aid and academic aid, but they're playing football because they love the game. And it's the purest form, I think. And uh, there's not strings attached to it. You know, I hear this all the time. A lot of times from transfers when they come in here, they go, well, uh, I wasn't getting an opportunity to play because there was somebody who, you know, the coaches, you know, they gave him the scholarship. So they had to play him versus, you know, whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. So there are, are no strings attached here. You know, nobody's getting scholarship money. So I don't have to play a kid because I have to justify why I gave him a scholarship. Yeah. You know? I'm not going to play a kid because he's out there, he's working his butt off and he's the best kid at his position. Well, and I think it's it's interesting. The coaches that I've talked to through this this season so far, um, it's kind of a Mike Tomlinism. You know, we don't we want volunteers, we don't want hostages. Division three yep. is the volunteer army. It's not a hostage yep. situation. So, right. um, you're exactly right, Coach. My last question before we get to the randoms: What is the message to your to the alumni for 2023? Well. I get asked that all the time. Every no matter where I go, you know, people say, "Hey, how are we going to be this year?" And um, you know, I, 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 I'm going to go back to probably what I said at the end of last year. If we can stay healthy, if we can stay healthy and keep all of our key guys on the field, I think we have a chance to be really good. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to. We might struggle a little bit defensively early in the year, trying to replace those two defensive tackles. Yeah, um, because we have guys who played there as backups, but now they have to be the guy. Now they're going to be the guy that's got to go out there and they've got to be able to control the football game on the defensive line. Um, so we may struggle a little bit defensively early, but I'm hoping that our offense, because we have so many guys back, we're going to be able to offset some of those shortcomings that we have on defense. But if we can stay healthy, I think we've got a chance – as we always do to not, not only win the conference title, but to go into the playoffs and make a run. And it's interesting that you say that because now we get away from football for a little bit. We're going to take five. You're going to get five questions. They're rapid fire as they're coming at you. Uh, the first one, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Oof. Um, you know, people are probably going to think this is really weird but I don't think I'd rather live any other place than in Minnesota. I've been, I got a chance to go to a lot of different states. I had a, a son who played uh, baseball for the University of Minnesota, so I got to travel to a lot of states. There's a lot of great places out there. 
but I'm a homebody and I love Minnesota and I can't see myself moving from here. What's the most important lesson you've learned over your career? And I think you've touched on this once or twice so far. (laughs) Preparation. Preparation. If you weren't, if you weren't coaching, what would you be doing? Oof. Well, being that I failed in those business classes that I took early on, <laughs> I can't say that. Uh, you know, I grew up on a farm, and um, you know, and I loved the farm, but I, you know, that was certainly not something I wanted to do as a. But I could see myself being the kind of guy who would be out doing something in nature, whether it was, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, forestry or something like that something that you're you're you know working the land that's you know I have a you know we have 10 acres my wife and I and we have a big vegetable garden we have a vineyard and you know we do a lot of that kind of stuff and a lot of flower gardens so um, I could see myself doing something like that where did you meet your wife believe it or not we both uh, taught at uh, at St. Cloud Cathedral our rooms are right down the hall from each other. I was the head football coach. She was a cheerleading advisor. Okay. How, how much better can you get, that, right? <laughs> that's 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 a pretty that's a pretty good match right there. Yep. yep. Uh, coach, what's the best compliment you've ever received? Um, I think the the best thing, and I've heard this from a lot of people, is that I'm honest. What's you know, the best insult I, you've ever received? That's Ooh, the see that's um, that's the double sided sword of the compliment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. <laughs> well, I know there were people who questioned whether I could follow somebody like John Gillardi. You know, uh, they said, you know, can he follow and do what John did? And fortunately, we've been able to keep it up. You know, but that when when I heard that that lit a fire under me for one you know I I think I always walk out every practice with a chip on my shoulder Mm -hmm. because I think there's people out there that think "Eh, I don't think he can do it you know whatever so um that would maybe maybe be the biggest insult yes and then our final question we ask everybody this question at the end of the show was there a question you were expecting to have and if so how would you have answered it Say, say that again. I missed that. I missed it. <clears throat> was there was there a question that you were expecting to get? And if so, how would you have answered it? That is a great question. Um, you know, I was playing in my head some of the questions you were possibly going to ask. Um, and um, about the only one that it, that you probably didn't ask was, um, um, do I feel like I've been successful since I've taken over? Because I've been asked that many times, you know, we've done very well, obviously. And, and mm-hmm. um, but I would say my answer to that would be my expectation is we want to win another national title here at St. John's. We've won four and I want to win one as the head coach. Yeah. And that would be the one question that if you would have said, do you feel like you've been successful what you've done? I would have said no, because we haven't won a national title. Well, that's, I think that's a great place to stop. I hope that maybe in 2024, you and I are having this conversation, but with another one of those behind you. Um, For those of you that know how we do this, if you're sticking around, we're going to overtime with uh, Serenity Brown. Uh, Coach, I want to say thank you very much for taking the time uh, and best of luck this season. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. And we will be right back, Chuckleheads. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carla Guadagnino. That's Serenity Brown. This is Overtime with her, Serenity Brown. Uh, we just finished with the number six team in the preseason. I followed where the tag was. That's rude. Why well, the tag us in a place that you can't, find, can't use it? That's all I'm saying. Isn't the back supposed to be where the tag goes? Okay. Coach Gary Fashion of St. John's University. Uh, the number six team in the country preseason rankings from D3.com. Um, genuinely nice person. Yeah. Just very nice. He he fulfills the stereotype of the Midwestern people. Um, really liked my questions, which made, gave me a boost during the interview. Boost your ego? Yeah, a little bit. Um, and in some polls that I've seen, 
he's they are ranked as high as fourth. So there's a lot of expectation for this team. Um, if you're watching us on YouTube, and uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, appreciate you. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. It really helps us out. Um, if you're listening to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, or wherever else you get your podcasts, really appreciate you. Make sure you hit the little bell. Uh, but we're on vacation right now. So uh, I know you don't have anything to say, no. and I want to get back to the beach. So okay. really appreciate you. We'll see you next week. Uh, season kicks off next week. So it's a big, exciting time. Uh, but we'll be back next week, Chuckleheads. Thanks for checking out this episode of Dingo Talk. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. For more info and to contact the show, you can find us on Twitter at Dingo Talk.